Hello, everyone. My name is Camelia Shofani, and I'm the Senior Manager of Public Programs and Events here at the International Documentary Association. For blind or low vision attendees, I have dark curly hair, dark eyes, light-ish skin, and I'm wearing a Beastie Boys t-shirt. I'd like to thank our sponsors, KCRW and Variety, for making this possible. Please visit documentary.org forward slash screening dash series for more information on our lineup and Q&As. This evening, we'll be having a conversation between Variety's Janelle Riley and director Ryan White and producer Jessica Hargrave, whose film Goodnight Oppie made its international debut at the 2022 Toronto International Film Festival. Before we get started, I'd like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. We recognize the Gabrielino Tongva as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land, water, and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. With that, I give you Janelle Riley. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this IDA screening and Q&A with Goodnight Oppie. My name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety, and I am so pleased to welcome from the movie producer Jessica Hargrave and director-producer Ryan White, along with ASL interpreter Andrea Lust. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on a beautiful movie. You've made everyone cry. Um, <laughs> I'm really curious, actually, when you both first became aware of the story of opportunity, because I remember hearing a little bit about it when it was first launched and, you know, it lasted longer than it was supposed to. But I don't think I really registered it at the time, nor even thought that, you know, it would it would make such a compelling subject for a documentary. Um, yeah, Ryan and I grew up together. We've been best friends since we were little kids, and Ryan has long been a space enthusiast, so he followed the story more than I did, um, and both of us became more aware of it uh, when uh, Opportunity finally finished her mission um, in 2019, and there was a tweet that went viral that was about her message, the message, the last message that she had sent from Mars, which was essentially that her battery was low and it was getting dark. And a lot of people latched on to that message specifically and what it meant for a robot to be sending such a heartfelt message, like this gut punch message to people millions of miles away who had had formed this connection with her. But like you, we didn't necessarily realize right away what this could, could be as a project um, until, you know, the next year when we had a meeting with our partners, Film 45 and Amblin, and they brought the idea up to us. And then we decided to, to move forward with the project. Now, I'm not someone who knows a lot about outer space or, to be honest, is, thinks that they're that interested. And I love that this film is still for me. Um, Ryan, you, you consider yourself a space enthusiast. Um, what was it about this particular story that interested you? And, and Jessica, as someone who doesn't consider themselves one, you know, what about it spoke to you? Well, our filmography is pretty varied in subject matter, but it's all character based. So typically what we love to do when we're making a film is be on some sort of wild journey with a person or a group of people as they're going through something remarkable. And I always wanted to make a space film because I was a space geek growing up, but we had heard a lot of pitches, but they weren't really character based. And so we said no to a lot of projects. And when this one came to us, I mean, we had never made a film about a robot. Um, it's our first non-human main character, um, but it felt like a character based film. And then especially once we started meeting what we call our human being characters, um, we were shocked, pleasantly shocked with how emotional they were. I think we have this preconceived notion that, <clears throat> excuse me, that scientists and engineers are going to be very unemotional, detached people. And every human being that we would interview about this was so emotional, the way they talked about this mission. And I think it was somewhat cathartic, because like Jess said, Opportunity died in 2019, and we were coming along less than a year later um, asking these people to talk about her life. And so they move very quickly on from mission to mission. And so I don't think they had had the time to really grieve uh, her death. 
And so we were shocked um, with how much they were re wearing their hearts on their sleeves in the way that they spoke about her. And that's, I think, when we knew we had something special, because that's where the real heart of the film comes from. And Jessica, uh, I don't mean to imply he had to convince you. <laughs> no, but you're right that the the uh, space isn't, I'm, I'm not as big a fan of space, it sounds silly to say, but like I'm not as much of an enthusiast as Ryan, really. I don't follow it as closely. Um, but that's, you know, what I love about my job too. And so that is what drew it to me as well is I feel like every time we make a project, I get to take a several year long course and whatever it is we're making the project about. I get to learn more about something I don't know a lot about. And so that was why. What I viewed this project as, but also for us as a partnership, as a company with our team, um, it was new muscles for us, you know, like the, the motto of JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena is dare mighty things, you know, and they do, they send robots to Mars and operate them millions of miles away for years. And to, to make a film about a project and a group of people who did something so remarkable, we knew we wanted to push the boundaries with the filmmaking as well. And so that's, um, you know, what brought us to, to decide to do these these uh, special effects with industrial light and magic with ILM. And that's something we'd never done before. So that too, like I always like to, we always like to challenge ourselves and learn new things in the filmmaking process as well. I actually, I want to jump ahead to the special effects. Um, and I would love to talk about the scene where you show the landing, which I know you collaborated with ILM on. Um, and this was your first time working with such impressive visual effects. What, what what sort of direction did you give them? Or is it more like your ILM, do what you want, and it'll be amazing? <laughs> it was, I mean, we were lucky that our partners were were Amblin and they they deal with visual effects all the time. And so the first step, even before ILM, was hooking me up with a storyboard artist named Josh Shepard. And, you know, he had never done a documentary before, but he has done a lot of big scripted films in television. And he and I began drawing the film, literally like pencil on paper, uh, drawing it frame by frame. And then those storyboards went to Industrial Light and Magic. So there was a lot of direction in that sense of, you know, we didn't know we didn't know like how you render out these shots, how long it takes. That was a huge learning curve for us. But they were looking to us saying, tell we can, we're magicians. We can do whatever you want. Tell us, tell us what you want. And the landing scene was probably the most exciting one to do because the robot moves 0.1 miles per hour. It's not the most exciting action on Mars. And we couldn't really exaggerate that. But the landing scene is nuts. Uh, and so watching that come together was incredibly exciting. But what we were doing. And the original pitch to ILM was like, we don't want to make a cartoon. So if this is going to look like a cartoon, we shouldn't even go down this path. But we have each rover, Spirit and Opportunity, had nine cameras on her. We have so much photography. We know exactly what every day of their journey looked like. We know from the orbiters above Mars what the terrain looks like, what their journeys looked like. So we have all of the photo reel information can you take this and all the data from NASA, you know, when the sun was rising, when the sun was setting, how much level of dust was in the air? Can you take all of that and make it look authentic? And they said, we've never done that before, but that sounds like a really fun challenge. Let's do it. And like I said, it takes years for these shots to come together. So for a long time, our cut is just black and white sketches and you're just trusting that ILM will deliver on their promise and they really I mean they really knocked it out of the park I think the biggest compliment we are getting now that we're showing the film is the NASA scientists that work on Mars every day saying this is shocking how real it looks I think I heard somewhere that at one point you intended to have the landing opening the movie hmm. yeah we did that was that was that was the cold open for a long time but then you know, the stakes of that landing, I, th that the landing scene uh, lives and dies on the tension in that room of whether it's going to succeed. And no matter how much of an action scene it is, when it was the cold open, you didn't understand that the two missions preceding it had just crashed. And so it felt like it lost its tension. It was like purely using it for action when it was a, when it was a cold open. And so we ended up swapping it out for a different one. I would actually love to talk about the process of putting this together because I'm wondering how much changed in editing, but I guess I'd love to start with basically the, the, the script. Like it's one thing to have all this footage, 
But how did you go about, you know, putting that into an actual storyline? Yeah, Jess, do you want to speak to the the pre-interviews that you did? Yeah, so, sure. So, um, you know, the what we where we normally start is reading as much as we possibly can, and thankfully there is a, a great book by the principal scientist um, Steve Squires, which we all read, and then there is a lot of information online, so we read as much as we could and started kind of crafting what we thought would be a rough timeline and finding people we wanted to talk to. Um, so NASA was very willing to partner with us in terms of handing us over archival, but also in terms of facilitating access to the people who had participated in the mission. So we came up with a list and started doing pre-interviews with people. This is all COVID times. They were all Zoom interviews and each of them lasted, you know, three, four hours. Everyone was very generous with their time. And as Ryan said, it was all very pleasantly surprising because each time, um, we would finish a Zoom, I would say, oh my gosh, that person was such a good storyteller. They had so many good stories. They, they're definitely going to be in the movie. And then, you know, you can't put everyone in because we also wanted, in addition to forming an attachment with the robot, of course, we want the audience to form an attachment with the people participating. So it needed to be a smaller group. But back to the script, um, in those pre-interviews, there were certain stories that kept coming up. You know, oh, you've got to include this, you've got to include this, or you won't, most people won't know this, but here's another thing you should know about. And so we were pulling that information. We, you know, transcribe all the interviews, pull all that information into the timeline. And at the same time, with that archival, we had a whole team of people logging it, watching that footage and looking for moments and kind of seeing where the things align. And then Ryan and our editor, Helen Kearns, you can speak to this, Ryan now worked on a script with all of that information. Yeah, we had never written a screenplay for a documentary, but it was necessary because of the visual effects. And so we used all of those pre-interviews to whittle it down to what seemed like the most essential stories from her journey and then and then start storyboarding them and you know so the real typically we're verite filmmakers meaning we're like out there in the field and when you're doing verite filmmaking you at least we don't ever write a screenplay we find that story in the edit room the writing happens with your your editors so this one was a little bit reverse engineering for us minus the archival the archival I had never made an archival film, but that's where we really got the verite, uh, that verite bug where we would get ha have all these people logging footage and then you would get, you know, someone sending you an email saying, oh my God, I found the most amazing scene of ABBA's SOS being played uh, when Spirit went missing. And that's where like the real documentary bug that we normally get from being out in the field came through in this film was finding those needles in a haystack. How much did the initial script, or I, I'm gonna say screenplay, did you, how much did it change from the final product or was it more just a matter of moving things around but it stuck pretty close to what you had written? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's remarkably similar to the original script but the script didn't include the archival moment. So that's that's where we really pivoted in the edit room but it did include all of the scenes that have visual effects and those, you know, like I said, they take years to make. So there's very few that you want to start creating and then take it out of your film. We couldn't be as nimble as we normally are um, in, in the edit bays. And we were also using the what's called the analyst notebook, also known as the Rover Diaries, which is what Angela Bassett is reading in our film. So we had all of those, which were a daily account of whatever both of the rovers were going through. And so those were a way we thought to like keep the audience on the adventure. Instead of it being a film that was looking back at their lives, we wanted it to be a day by day uh, film. And so we used those Rover Diaries to keep us, you know, in the present day. And those were all a part of the screenplay as well. Since you mentioned the amazing Angela Bassett, <laughs> um, first of all, uh, who had the brilliant idea to cast her and was it, you know, still in the script phase? Because I would imagine I'd just be hearing her voice even as I'm writing. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the little gay boy in me in Georgia went to see What's Love Got to Do With It like three or four times in the movie theater. And she was like my hero after seeing that film. So I've always been a huge Angela Bassett fan. And I was reminded today that she was in Contact, which I totally forgot, which was a film I loved growing up and a huge inspiration um, for this film. So like the black and white pencil sketches for a very long time, our film was our production assistant, James Robinson, him reading track recordings for our editors. And he has a lovely voice. 
Um, but we were always, I always had Angela's voice in my head. I just thought we would never get her. I thought it was too pie in the sky. Um, and I, I remember talking to Amazon about it and saying, I'd love Angela to do this. And they said like, oh my God, if you can get Angela to do it, we are 100% on board. And just reached out to her team. And, you know, this whole movie was a series of people that we thought would never want to work with little documentary filmmakers wanting to be a part of this film. And I think it's because the story does something to people's hearts. And Angela watched the film and loved it. And recording with her was one of the best days of our entire filmmaking lives, wouldn't you say, Jess? It's so cool. She just, she just like, put, I don't know, she's such a pro and she put her so whole self into it. And she had, I, I'm like a super fan too. So I kept the little notes that she'd written on the script about like how she wanted to deliver the lines, you know, and I, and they like just aligned, you know, she was so good. And it was, we were so grateful to have her. We feel like she really added a layer uh, of weight and wisdom to the, to the words. Uh, going back to the the footage that you were given, do you have an idea how many hours of footage that was and how many people you had working on this for, for how long? Uh, it was almost a thousand hours. Um, and we had probably like five loggers whose jobs were to do this 100% of the time all day. And then, and the, it was, you know, we could do it. We'd worked out a remote system because it was COVID. So they could, they were everywhere. They were not just here in LA. And then our AEs and our associate editor also watched and our editors also watched. So it was a team effort. And, you know, there were a lot of, of days where people would say, I just watched like someone at her computer for five hours and then like a science meeting and, you know, but you can't skip those because you don't know, right? You don't get a tape that says this is going to have the ABBA SOS scene or this is going to have Abigail Freeman, who goes on to become deputy project scientist, appear in the background when she's only 15 and was lucky enough to get picked for a high school program and be in the room. Like somebody found that. She didn't know that existed. I told her about it before she saw the film. And I was like, I'm sure you've seen that before. And she was like, I've never seen that before, you know? And, and so our associate editor, Bernie Chavez, she found that. And she said, this is Abigail. This is the woman you guys did that pre-interview with. And she told, she had told us she'd been in the room, but she found the footage of it. And so someone's looking for all those moments and like the big yawn that someone does when they're living on Mars time, which makes them start planning meetings at midnight sometimes, you know? So finding all that stuff, it, it, they, they did an amazing job. Like they really had an amazing system on Slack, which Ryan and I are too old for, but the young folk had a great system of keeping it all organized and, and letting us know what they'd found. And we're so, it just really adds another element to the movie. I, you know, the fact that there was footage from the beginning is so amazing. I, I'm sorry to be so granular about this, but I'm so curious. <laughs> um, do they just sort of watch it and make a log? Or, but if they see something that they know, they, yeah, they, they, they like send a flare up? No, it's a great question. Yeah, we had, we came up with themes. And so they would tag, uh, like put markers in with certain themes or certain names, you know, once we knew it, it's like, oh, here's this person and here's this theme. And they would identify those things. But yes, if they found something that they were like, this is beyond me just dropping the marker in and you finding it later. Like, it's like a email goes around to everybody and says, you know, here's something that you should look at right away. Cause this could be a whole scene, you know, like Abba's SOS, which Reg Cabrera, our editor worked on for a couple days and just said like Ryan sit tight I've got something going here and I'm going to show you it in a couple of days you know Ryan likes to see things quickly but but and then he had found this amazing scene that just was unfolding before your eyes mm. that's so fascinating to me as someone who has such a short attention span <laughs> do that. Um, and I imagine they all have to kind of be experts in the field too because they have to know what they're looking for and you know yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not because you can't like you You don't want them and they know this. We don't want them just to stick to the themes that have been previously determined. Right. There could be something we don't even know about. Right. So it's like also having to be good storytellers themselves and recognize like, hey, this is worth bringing up and this is worth flagging. And I keep seeing this person and you guys haven't pre-interviewed her, but she's amazing and you should talk to her, you know. And so it's like, yeah, yeah, well, of course we'll do that. So. Um, I, I, yeah, they, they, it's such a, it's an interesting skill set. It's really like kind of like a, a, a precursor to like editing and, or producing, but it's like learning that, that craft of finding the story. Um, I want to go back and talk about some of the people that you do interview because you, you, I was surprised as you were just how engaging 
they, they were. And, and again, like how emotional it, that kind of caught me off guard as well. Um, and you said that, you know, when the first time you would talk to these people, you were like, this has to go in, this has to go in. Um, obviously you can't include everyone. Um, how did you sort of decide what to use? Like it, it, it almost feels like an audition process <laughs> with these people or was it, did it come down to more, you know, the story they had to tell? I think that's a really awful part of documentary filmmaking, at least that I don't enjoy, is like never being able to fully represent people that worked on something and having to do, you know, it, it is it is a crude term, but auditioning and casting uh, was a little gut wrenching, I think, for this film, because it's thousands of people that worked on these robots, you know, just inter pre interviewed dozens of them. Um, and they were all incredible. And we know there are hundreds of people who are incredible that we have never met who are probably amazing storytellers. So we have 11 people in our film. Um, I'm sure you could make a great film with 11 others, and then another great film with 11 others. Uh, our process was a lot about, well, first of all, we wanted it to feel epic because the mission was so long. So it was a lot about being inter intergenerational. So, you know, we have, there were people that passed away during this mission who pop up in the archival a lot, but then you have interviewees in their seventies, and then you have interviewees in their twenties who inherited opportunity you know, and never expected her to live so long that that these young women would get to work on the robot that inspired them to become a scientist um, or an engineer. And it was a lot about finding people that audiences would see themselves represented on screen. Like yesterday, I was doing a lot of press um, with with publications in India. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how proud they were that one of their women worked on this rover. And so it's not just Americans working on this. This is like an international venture. And so showing people from around the world that worked on this, and you know, that's why we're thrilled to partner with Amazon Prime, which is worldwide. And hoping, you know, a little girl in India might be watching this film and thinking, you know, working for NASA or going to Mars is never going to be an opportunity for her. And that seeing that Vandy Verma is a rover driver now, and she was inspired to do that because she got a book about space when she was little. So we were probably more so than any of the films that we've made, very conscious of the audience and making sure that they that that especially young audiences could look at the film and say why can't why can't i do that to that end i was i was going to ask you if you have been surprised by how much people have embraced this film but uh, again jessica as someone who didn't consider themselves a space enthusiast when when you know that you're into something do do you figure it's going to play pretty well with an audience i mean i hope so and i think the thing that's been such a pleasant surprise for us. I mean, it was a goal, but still it's nice to see is, is a response of young people. I mean, this isn't a kid's movie. Like we still, it's, it's definitely a documentary. It's definitely for adults, but the fact that young people have come and, and felt the way that we wanted them to feel, you know, Ryan and I did a Q and a recently in San Francisco and we walked in towards the end of the movie and kids were just like applauding at the selfie scene, which is towards the end of the film. They were just so excited about like the accomplishments of the rover that, that it, it was just like, I was tearing up. I was just so moved to see them so moved. And I, I mean, like the story is there, right? Like, but it hadn't come to them. And so I was glad that we were able able to bring it to them. And even last night, um, Jennifer Trosper, who is a mission manager in the film, and now I'm not sure what her title is, but she is something very, very like running the mission for the Perseverance rover. She was there and saw the film for the first time last night because she's missed all of the pre-screenings we had done, unfortunately. And she brought her two kids and her, she was like, listen, I land rovers on Mars all the time. And like, I, you know, this is my job. And I'm, I'm always working on these things that I think are interesting. I bring rovers to their schools. I do all this stuff. And they're always kind of ho-hum. And she was like, and after this, they stood up and said, that was cool. <laughs> and she was like, it was so impactful for me and for them that they all, you know, could experience it in a similar way and feel everyone feel that same sense of wonder and awe that as adults, we just don't really find that much anymore. But she was feeling it again, too. That's great. Um, you mentioned that you did things sort of differently on this film in, in several different ways, writing a script. And um, is there anything that you really liked about this process that you think might actually change your filmmaking going forward? Well, every, I mean, every film is different and the, the, the toolkit that you use is based on, at least for us, like the demands of that story. So we don't, we don't need visual effects for a film about Dr. Ruth, <laughs> um, you know? So I think 
what was really fun about this one. And I think, I hope that documentary filmmakers continue. And I see this in a lot of my friends film that um, we are getting access now to a lot of resources that scripted filmmakers have had for a long time that just haven't been relegated to documentary filmmakers when we're seen as the broccoli of filmmaking. And now I think we're seeing that documentaries are taken seriously as pieces of art, but also pieces of entertainment, and they can be commercial and entertaining. And when you do have a story like this, you can still make a documentary about it, but you can give, which Amazon gave us access to these resources that we typically um, wouldn't have in filmmakers. But to answer your question, like, absolutely, I would love to continue I would love to find another story that kind of pushes boundaries in that type of way or a completely new way that we haven't done. Like a big part of our calculus in picking projects is not only that we have to love the character and the journey, but Jess and I are always really drawn to like, oh my God, we have no idea how to do that. We love, it's almost like an addiction. Like, can we do that? Like, do <laughs> we're, like we're gonna work with ILM. We're clueless about this stuff. And like just do a, a crash course. And I love that feeling of feeling totally clueless at the beginning of film and leaving feeling like I've mastered something. Um, and so I don't know if that will be visual effects on the next film, but I think we'll continue to do pro projects that like push our boundaries as, as storytellers or as artists. And, you know, I haven't even really gotten into the fact that you made this during COVID, um, but I am curious what for each of you was the biggest challenge in making this film? Gosh. Um... I think uh, I, I think COVID aside, it was it, this is definitely like the biggest team we've ever had. Um, and I think, but I but I guess dealing with the fact that it, it was also COVID and everyone was everywhere. But you know, it's like finding the way to make as a producer. I'm coming from the producer mind here. Like find a, a way to make all these puzzle pieces fit together. You know, and again with people remotely and everywhere. Like ILM. I mean, I was, certainly wasn't managing the whole ILM team, but they had artists, you know, all over the world who worked on the project. And so finding a way to make sure that we were in sync with them and communicating with everyone who's on the archival team and everyone who's doing the production interviews and all the, I just added another element to something that uh, it's, it's, added an other element to the production part of it is managing all of the different elements and all the different teams who were working together. Um, for me, from a director's point of view, I mean, there were there were many challenges and some of them we've spoken about already, but I think one of them, and it's really interesting to show the film to audiences now because you never know, like no matter how much feedback you get from your internal team, you never know how these films are going to be perceived. Uh, and we had a screening last night, our Los Angeles premiere and all the scientists and engineers were there. Um, and I had a friend who came up, three friends that said the, basically the same comment where they said like, I just started crying in the first 90 seconds and it basically never stopped. It like mm -hmm. ebbed and flowed throughout it. So to me, one of the biggest challenges was that tone. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm telling you, we did not, we were not like puppeteering in the edit room saying, will audiences cry? And can we make them cry at this scene? That was that was never even a conversation. Like, will people cry a lot during this film? We didn't, we, ne we never discussed that. But there was something, I don't know, there's something about it. I think it gets to what Jess was saying earlier. And I know this is why it was such a gift for us to get to make this film, especially during COVID when we were alone. <laughs> it, it does something to that like childlike sensibility that we all had that gets lost in our adult lives a lot. And to get to watch people who get to live that every day and still work in a world that has wonder and awe and discovery adventure. I think there's something for audiences that even from the beginning of the film takes you back to that place. And I always say our biggest, our biggest comp for this film uh, was E.T. Uh, you know, and it was it was my favorite film growing up. Jess and I watched it together immediately once we took this job. We were making this film with Amblin. You know, E.T. on the basket is on our poster. I still can't believe that. And I know our film will never be the cinematic masterpiece that E.T. is, but we were trying to at least capture that tone. And it has that very simple narrative trajectory of a non-human character that the that the humans bond with and then at the end you have to say goodbye to that character like very simply that's what goodnight oppie is about but finding that in the edit room and helen kearns and reg cabrera 
are our incredible editors and they are so good at at tone but it was it was very difficult to strike that i think so as these big et fans how was it to like to, what was it like to work with spielberg how did you keep your cool <laughs> well it's not, it's not like it's not like we were on set with spielberg every day or we would not have kept our cool i assure you uh no we we, we dealt with uh uh Daryl Frank and Justin Falvey are our producers from Amblin. And like I, I was saying them to last night, like the fact that they even trusted us to tell this story is so, is so, uh, it's such an honor. Um, and we did get feedback from Spielberg on the film and I'll, I'll mostly keep it private, but it was incredibly complimentary and he loved the film and he was proud of it. It made him cry. He was one of our first notes of saying I cried three times. And so mm -hmm. We knew it might be more emotional than we thought it was, but I mean, a total, a total filmmaking. I mean, one of my other favorite films is Jaws. Um, so Spielberg, I know he's probably every filmmaker's hero, but he's de definitely mine as well. And George Lucas's company and Pete Berg's company. It was like, it was just a series of getting to work with your, your heroes and their companies. And we're just so grateful. It's only fair that someone makes Steven Spielberg cry in a while because he's made us all cry so many times. <laughs> now, you've probably been asked a lot about this, but one of my favorite parts are the scenes with the wake up songs. Um, is there any chance we can get a playlist or, or soundtrack release with this? Yes, we have um, our actually a couple of our interns put together because there were a few playlists that existed out there and a few lists. So our interns put them together. Um, we need to do like a, a release of it. I mean, it's out there. It's on Spotify, but because we were all listening to them, too, and sort of seeing listening to the variety of songs that were included. But was at first, I think we, we thought we were going to come at it that way, like listen to these songs and see which songs we like. But then we realized that's not actually the way we wanted to come about it. Like then it was more about like, Oh, again, going back to like the archival, finding this element, finding this song existing and being played and how it relates to the story, because that's how they would pick the wake up songs. They wouldn't just pick them because they liked them. I mean, sure, that was part of it, but they would pick them in large part because of what the rovers were going through. So that's how we decided we would pick them too. like we wanted to have the songs that were included be songs that were native to what was going on that were played because of a reason and they don't necessarily have to be your favorites they just have to be the the songs that were being played at the time and and then we were very fortunate that again coming back to the the theme of the story I mean it's music clearance was not what I said was the hardest even though it popped into my head because normally it is very difficult but this time it actually wasn't that bad because people if you call them and you say you know we're putting this sound, we're using this as soundtrack to our movie. That's one thing. But if you call them and you say, you may not know this, but you know, this group of scientists and engineers played your song when they were feeling down and out because a rover that was on Mars and they'd been operating millions of miles away was having a tough time. And this song was there to lift their spirits, get them back on board and, you know, make the rover come back to life. Like that's a totally different pitch where people are like, that's pretty cool. I actually didn't know that. And that sounds great. Go right ahead. <laughs> Not for free, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, again, I want to remind everyone that this movie is in theaters now and it'll be on Amazon Prime November 23rd. Um, so you can cry in the comfort of your own home. <laughs> um, it's such a wonderful film. Again, congratulations and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Janelle.